Hi all, my name is Jenny and I'm back today to do another video. Today I'll be chatting through my 2020 end of the year reading stats as well as going over my favorite books for 2020. Since we have so much to cover let's just get right into things. So in the year of 2020 I did read 151 books which totaled to about 47,779 pages. Granted some of the books that are included in my 2020 reading spreadsheet I did start in 2019 and some books that I started in 2020 I did not finish so they're not included in this spreadsheet. However roughly I read about 47 thousand pages. Additionally of those 151 books, five of those books were DNFs. However, I did include the number of pages that I read in the book as opposed to the total number of pages in the book when filling out my reading spreadsheet. The month that I read the most books in during 2020 was July when I read 22 books and the month that I read the least number of books was February where I read seven books which does make sense since February is the shortest month of the year. My reading varied quite a lot during the year although it definitely increased quite a bit once lockdown started in March and April and the average number of books that I read over the course of the 12 months each month was about 12.5 books. In terms of star rating for the 151 books I read, 14 of the books that I read were 5 stars, 66 were 4 stars, so that's between 4 and 5, either 4.25, a 4.5, or a regular 4. 46 were between 3 and 4 stars, 18 were between 2 and 3 stars. I did have one 1 star book that I read for the book 2 prize, kudos if you can remember what that book is. As I said I had 5 DNFs and then I had one book that I did finish but I decided not to rate it. It felt at the time that I finished it inauthentic to rate it because I thought the content was so important I just personally did not get along with the writing style. Additionally the most common star rating that I gave was a four star which was 34% of the books that I read or 51 books. In terms of categories of the 151 books I read 112 or 74% of them were fiction, 35 of them or 23% were non-fiction, three were poetry collections which was 2% of my total reading and I read one anthology that was a mix of poetry, non-fiction, and fiction and that was 1% of my reading. Then to break down those categories further I have this graphic that breaks down all of my reading by genre. As we can see my most popular genre was literary fiction that was 36%. Then the 24% is all non-fiction including the anthology that was a mixture of both fiction and non-fiction. So we can see the breakdown of all of my non-fiction genres in the smaller pie chart on the right. My second most popular genre was within fiction was romance which I did read 12 books in that genre and then every other genre I read less than 10 books which accounted for 6% or less of my total reading. Then moving on to some more kind of metadata about the books and authors themselves. First 93% of my reading or 140 of the books that I read during 2020 were written for adults. Nine of those books were written for young adults and two of the books that I read in 2020 were middle grade books. So as you can see I definitely skew much towards adult books and this is actually a stronger skew towards adult books than I've seen in previous years. Then in terms of author gender this has stayed pretty consistent throughout my last several years where I've been tracking my reading on an Excel spreadsheet like this but 79% or 119 of the books I read were written by authors that I identify as female, 28 or 19% were written by authors that I identify as male, I had three anthologies that had authors of multiple genders and then I had one book that was written by a non-binary author. I would like to see that number increase in the future as I definitely don't read a lot of books by authors that are not cisgender so I would like to kind of expand that element of my reading in the future. Then in terms of author race this one was about on par as I expected it to be but I would like th to see these numbers shift a bit in the coming years. So 52% of the authors that I read this year were white which was 78 books in total. My next most popular category in terms of author race were black authors which includes both authors born in the United States as well as all of the authors from my African Women Writers Project, all of whom were born in Sub-Saharan Africa, in addition to some Black Canadian and Black British authors as well. My next most popular category was Asian or Asian American authors who wrote 18 of the total books that I read this year, which totaled to about 12% of my reading. Then finally the last for author race categories that I use which are Middle Eastern, Latinx, Indigenous, or multiple. I read five books that fit into each of those categories and multiple is primarily anthologies that had authors of multiple races. Several of those anthologies did have white authors in addition to authors of color. Moving on then to the medium of the books that I read. So in total I read 95 physical books or 63% of my reading. This was surprising to me actually because I thought I'd read more ebooks than I guess I actually have but ebooks accounted to 32% of my reading or 40 eight books in total and then audiobooks were 
5% of my reading or 8 books in total. I do foresee audiobooks increasing slightly in 2021, although I don't think dramatically as I read audiobooks very slowly, so I don't think getting through more than one or two a month is really realistic for me. However, I do wonder if in 2021, as I continue to read advanced copies through NetGalley, if that ebook number will increase and my physical book number will decrease. I also like to keep track of where the book came from, both on a broad scale and also a more specific scale. So in terms of books that I had purchased, or gotten from NetGalley versus the library. I had 21 books this year that came from the library, which was only 14% of my reading. I do think I am in part attributing this to the fact that my physical library was closed for several months, and that is actually a popular way that I like to get books. However, that also motivated me to read a lot of books off my shelf, so I do appreciate that. I love the library and I love to support the library, but I do think with my reading goal of reading from my physical TBR shelf, I will have to not be using the library as much for a little while. Then 128 of the books that I read this year, or 85% were books that I owned either on Kindle or requested from NetGalley or were physical books from my physical TBR shelf. And then finally I had two books that I either borrowed from a friend or I had a book that I also listened to on Scribd through a free trial. So that only counted for 1% of my reading. I also like to keep track of where I acquired my books even more specifically than that. So actually the most populous category of this year is NetGalley, which accounted for 29 of the total books that I read this year, or 19% of my reading. Reading. The next most popular category for where I acquired a book is one of my local independent bookstores. There are three primarily that I shop from on a regular basis and then a fourth that I visit on occasion. It's a children's bookstore so I don't visit it as frequently but that accounted for 27 of the total books that I read this year or 18% of my total reading. Additionally the library or my other category which was a catch-all for books that I'm not sure where they came from or books that I borrowed from friends etc also was 27 of the total books that I read or 18% of my reading. Then my third most popular category is independent bookstores that are not local. So prior to COVID-19 happening, I loved to travel and whenever I visited a new place, I love to visit at least one or two bookstores just because I feel like that gives you a great sense of what the city is like. And so there's several bookstores in other cities, including my college town and Savannah has a bookstore that I absolutely love that I was supporting during COVID-19, but then also potentially had books that I purchased physically at that bookstore several years ago that I read this year, so that was also a pretty populous category. Then some of the other categories include online retailers, this includes thrift books, book outlet, which I no longer shop from, but I did order some books for at the beginning of the year, and Better World books. I also got six books on Amazon Kindle. This is primarily because whenever my mom delays her arrival to Amazon, she gets some Amazon credit, and I usually can gift myself a book for free with that credit. I also have gotten some books from Half Price Books, which I don't include as a like local independent bookstore even though some of these books are from my local half price because I just think of it as a kind of larger company and like to keep it separate. Additionally I've also globbed together Barnes & Noble and Target which had three of the total books that I read this year. Eight of the books that I read this year were gifts so that accounted for five percent of my total reading and then 14 books were from book of the month which accounted for nine percent of my total reading. So a lot of different places that I acquired these books which I am pleased with particularly that primarily the books came from either Night Gallery so they were read for review or they came from independent bookstores because that's something that I definitely like to prioritize and I'm glad to see that that is the case with these numbers. Then then moving into the year that the book was published, I have only two books that were published prior to 2000. Both of these I think were in the second half of the 20th century, if I'm remembering correctly, which was only 1% of my reading. I then had four books that were published between 2000 and 2009. I then read 41 books or 27% of my reading that was published between 2010 and 2018. But then I also read 41 books or 27% of my reading published just in 2019. And then even more shocking than that, I had had 60 books that I read this year that were published in 2020 and then I also had three books that I read towards the end of the year that I had received early for review that are actually not coming out until 2021 so that only counted for two percent of my reading but it is exciting that I read three books that are coming out in 2021 in 2020. Then for some final statistics that don't have any graphical representation with them the average length of a book that I read this year was 317 pages and the shortest book that I read this year was a poetry collection, A Thousand Mornings by Mary Oliver, which was only 77 pages. And the longest book that I read this year was Duck's Newberry Report at 1,020 pages, and I hated every second of it. I also, as I said, read 29 arcs. I read 121 books by authors that were new to me. 54 of those books were debuts, whether that was a short story collection, novel, or nonfiction work. 
I spent an average of 13 days reading each book, although the shortest amount of time that I read a book was a single day and the longest amount of time was 157 days for my New Daughters of Africa anthology, which was a little over five months. Then finally, the average amount of months that a book sat unread on my shelves was 4.9 months, which I find interesting. So those are all my statistics. If you are interested in learning more about how I track this reading, I have a reading spreadsheet that I'm happy to share with anyone if you want to let me know down in the comment section below if you're interested in checking it out. I've made it myself. It's really not fancy. If you know anything about Excel, you can probably make it yourself. And I find it the best way to track the data that I'm most interested in. I do know, however, there are some people here on booktube that also make their reading spreadsheets available. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but if you just search reading spreadsheet on the interwebs, I'm sure you will find some people that can offer their reading spreadsheet as well. But I do track this information primarily just for my own enjoyment because I find this stuff really interesting. But if you are interested in learning more about kind of that process, I'm happy to kind of do a video about it or explain it in the comment section down below. Now kind of shifting gears a little bit, we're going to go into my favorite books of the year. And since the reading stats portion of this video is already fairly long, I'm going to be pretty brief in going over these favorite books, especially because many of them I've talked about at length on my channel. But I did just want to kind of mention books that were really exciting to me this year that I thought I would recommend in kind of a bulk video to all of you. I will also mention that since I will be doing this superlative style, given as we saw from my genre breakdown, I read a lot of different books that are in a lot of different categories, and it feels just kind of odd to try to put them side by side against one another because it's difficult for me to think of a literary fiction novel as the best when compared to like a romance novel that I really enjoyed reading. So I thought a superlative style for favorite books of the year would be more appropriate to kind of capture the things that I really enjoyed in books, even though these books are all very different from one another and brought me different things. So I have 15 superlatives to go over and that totals to 20 books because it's my channel and I can do what I want. Um, in some of these categories I wanted to have multiple books because I just enjoyed all of these books quite a lot. I would recommend all of them, although potentially not to everyone, but that's the joy of my eclectic reading taste. It's definitely not every book I read will be for everyone else. But I did enjoy all of these books, and if any of them sound intriguing to you, I definitely would recommend checking them out. So the first of my book superlatives, I have best debut novels or books that I'm most excited to see where the author goes next. So I have three of those books, the first of which is Days of Distraction by Alexander Chang. I read this and actually reviewed it right at the beginning of starting my channel back in April, which I'll put a link to that video up in the cards above as well as in the description box below. And I'll do that for all of the books that I mentioned here. If I talk about them on my channel, they'll be linked down below for a more in-depth review. But I really enjoyed this one. This is a millennial fiction novel about a young woman who is moving from the Silicon Valley area, Bay Area, to follow her boyfriend to graduate school and basically kind of coming to terms with what she wants out of life and what she's expecting out of this relationship as well as kind of musing on their interracial relationship and kind of what that means for her as an Asian American woman. So I really enjoyed this one. I know Alexandra Chang has a short story collection coming out either this year or maybe next year. I'm intrigued to see what she does next, particularly given that this was a very millennial fiction-y debut and I'm curious to see if she kind of continues to work within that like newfound genre or if she kind of moves in a different direction. The same is also true for another one of my best debuts which was Lester by Raven Leilani. I really enjoyed this one and particularly loved Leilani's writing style. I read this back in October and I'm really intrigued again to see if Leilani continues with these kind of ideas of grappling with what is common in millennial fiction or if she moves in a really different direction. I honestly could see her going in both ways so I'm excited to kind of track her career as well. And then the last book that I'm excited to see where the author goes next is Sleepover Stories by Ashley Bryant Phillips. This one I read back in July for the reading rush and really enjoyed these stories. I think they are very visceral. They remind me a lot of Carson McCullers and I found that the way that Bryant Phillips thinks about the South in particular, as she is from rural North Carolina and a lot of these stories are set there, to be really thought-provoking and kind of new and novel. So I'm intrigued to see also where Bryant Phillips goes next and if she continues to kind of work within this region of the country or if she moves elsewhere. I do know that she still lives in the South, I believe, but I don't believe she lives in rural North Carolina any longer. So excited about her kind of author trajectory as well. Then my next category is the best book from the first two months of the 
the year. I find often that my like best books that I read during the year happen during the middle six months of the year. So the first three months are kind of meh and then the last three months are often kind of meh. So I wanted to pick books that specifically I really enjoyed during those time periods. So the book that I enjoyed at the beginning of the year the most was Queenie by Candace Carty Williams. This one I read back in January. It was one of the first that I read and I really love this. This is another, I would say it fits within the millennial fiction category, which obviously as we all know is something that I really enjoy. But I found Queenie's struggles in this to be really realistic and thought-provoking. Queenie in this book has recently broken up with a boyfriend who she believes they're kind of on a trial separation but we as the reader and obviously the boyfriend know that they are never getting back together and so Queenie kind of is spiraling down into like a depressive state and as we watch her kind of falling apart we also see her grappling with a lot of kind of these un dealt with issues of trauma in her life and kind of how she is learning to become a better person, which I really appreciated. This one would also work well for my previous category and that's probably true for a lot of these books that there's a lot of overlap, but Candace Cardi Williams is also another author that I'm really excited to kind of continue watching her work. And this is definitely one that I've thought about kind of throughout the rest of the year. And then in terms of my best book from the last three months of the year, we have A Measure of Belonging, 21 Writers of Color on the New American South, edited by Sunil Barnes. This I read for nonfiction November and absolutely loved. I think every essay in this collection is really phenomenal and deals with a lot of really important issues. This also touched on kind of a lot of themes that I really like such as exploring the South and the complexities of the South, particularly as a place where people of color have always lived throughout America's history and always been acknowledged as living here. I find that element of America's history to be really fascinating. I also am intrigued to kind of follow a lot of these authors so I was really pleased that I read this and it introduced me to a lot of authors that perhaps I otherwise would not have read. Then category number four is the best book that was worth the hype which definitely has to be Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo which obviously is very well acclaimed. It co-won or really should have just won the Man Booker Award. It was shortlisted for this year's Women's Prize and was phenomenal. I absolutely love this one. I read it back in April and would highly recommend it. I am singing along with the chorus on this one in terms of the complexities presented here and the realism. I found it to be an immensely readable book despite its somewhat experimental prose style. It doesn't have any periods if I'm remembering correctly. I also found that the 12 women portrayed here really felt different from one another but also all very realistic for different kind of types of women. So really enjoyed this one quite a lot and would definitely encourage you to read it if you have not already. And then category number five is my best book that was underhyped and for that I'm going with The Most Fun We Ever Had by Claire Lombardo. This one I read back in January and I really enjoyed it. It also is, along with millennial fiction, a type of like subgenre of literary fiction that I really enjoy which is like a multi-generational family saga that covers a number of decades. I really love deep diving into one particular family and their issues and their relationships and this book, given it's almost 600 pages, definitely does that quite well. I also found the family in here while kind of filled with a lot of like upper middle class white people problems. I really enjoyed that about this book and I feel like it was really realistic in talking about the complexities of these relationships and how one small issue can spiral into such large problems within family and how a lot of kind of things unsaid in childhood can then have huge repercussions as adults. I really enjoyed that aspect. It also had a lot of funny moments in here and overall I just really enjoyed this one. This is another debut that I would love to see where Clara Lombardo goes next. So this was definitely one that I also wanted to include on this list, particularly given that I've not really heard anyone talk about it here on booktube. Then category number seven is a best book that I otherwise would not have read. And this is true for two different books for two different reasons. The first of which is Lainey by Max Porter. This one I would not have read otherwise because I didn't really plan to read it. However, I read it for the booktube prize and I really enjoyed it. While Girl, Woman, Other was my favorite book that I read for the booktube prize, this one I think was my second. I honestly can't remember how I rated them now. But this was not one I was planning on picking up, but I really enjoyed it. I did particularly enjoy the audiobook of this one. I think it's really well done. And I just like the lyrical and more experimental style in here. I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much as I did. And I definitely would recommend checking this one out if you kind of like some more experimental writing or even if you don't because that's not usually something I uh, enjoy but I did really like this book quite a lot for that reason. And then another book that I probably otherwise wouldn't have picked up I got from Book of the Month which was Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore. This one I picked on a whim because I liked the cover and it sounded intriguing. This is a historical fiction novel that's set in the 1970s in Texas and has a lot of kind of interesting ideas about feminism and its relationship to environmentalism and 
oil companies and the patriarchy and just all of those themes are kind of tied really nicely in an interesting story here that otherwise I definitely don't think I would have picked up and is also another book that I would say is underhyped. I really enjoyed this one quite a lot and I've not heard that many people talk about it but I definitely would recommend it if you have heard about this one or and are somewhat intrigued to read it. Then category number eight is the best book where I learned the most and that definitely has to go to The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, Native America from 1890 to the Present by David Truer. This one basically every single page I learned something new. This is not a period of American history that really gets discussed whatsoever in the American public school system and is such an important and relevant aspect of our history that I think we need to really dedicate ourselves to acknowledging more in the United States. And so I loved reading this book and understanding understanding the ways that Indigenous people have always been here in the United States and continue to be here and continue to fight for their rights despite the fact that everyone around them is continually trying to silence them. I also found the kind of current event discussions about marijuana legalization and casinos and the wealth that's associated with that and kind of class disparities within Indigenous groups to also be really fascinating and overall I found David Truer's work to be incredibly readable despite the fact that it's very dense and kind of more academically minded but definitely if you are an American citizen then I think this should be like required reading. I absolutely loved it. Definitely one of my favorite books and it was my favorite nonfiction book for quite a while before something did bump it off the list but this is one that I had to include just because it was a favorite for so long throughout the year and this one I finished in April. Then category number nine is two of the best books that made me happy. These are both just lighthearted romances that I really enjoyed. The first of which I read back in January which is Playing House by Ruby Lang. This is a romance novella about two urban planners which is the field that I am hoping to enter into and so I really enjoyed the fact that they were urban planners in this book. I also found their relationship to be really fun and I also felt that this played with the novella format in a really good way. It definitely used the kind of time constraints of a novella I think to its advantage. So super enjoyed this one, would definitely recommend Ruby Lang if you are a romance reader and have not checked her out. And then the other one I read in April and that's Luck of the Draw by Kate Claiborne. Kate Claiborne is another romance author that I really like. I think she writes heroines that are really independently minded and smart and kind but also the relationship dynamics and the complications surrounding the relationships I always find to be really realistic. So I really enjoyed this one as well, would highly recommend both of these if you're just looking for a light romance that's kind of fun and will make you feel happy. And then category number 10 was the best books to a start of a series that I'm excited to continue on in. This is another category that I have two books for, the first of which is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. This one I read with my in real life slash actually it's virtual but these people I knew originally in real life book club that I do with two of my best friends and we read this as our June and July pick and absolutely loved it. My other two friends have read several other books in the series but I have not yet. I definitely hope to read more of this series in 2021 and this follows two best friends living in Naples, Italy in the 1950s as they continue through their life journey. So this is another one of these like book boxes books that is about friendship and a story that takes place over multiple decades and it's very detailed but it feels very realistic. I really enjoyed the reading experience of this book. It felt like a very comforting book to read as I was reading it and it's definitely one that I've continued to think about after I finished it. So excited to continue on with Elena Ferrante and our two brilliant friends. And then I'm also excited to continue on in the world of The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. This one I read back in June and absolutely loved. I think the world building in here is phenomenal. It touched on a lot of themes that I particularly enjoy in fantasy such as talking about real life issues like white supremacy and the patriarchy and those manifesting as actual evils. I also found the characters in here to be really fun although they are somewhat of caricatures that took me like five times to say so I hopefully said it right that time of the different boroughs of New York City so they do kind of have some stereotypes associated with them but they also felt very fully realized to me so super excited to continue on the, in this series. Then category number 11 is the best book for reflecting and this one I actually did a full review of with my mom which is The Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd. This is another literary historical fiction novel that retells the story of Jesus through his wife Anna's perspective. I really loved this one and it really made me think a lot about Jesus as a person and what he would have believed and what he would have promoted as his values and I think that's a really kind of obviously Christianity is full of like self-reflection and introspection but I think Suman Kidd did a great job of kind of offering some new perspectives on that that are not necessarily inherently like 
things you discuss in a church or theology. So while this is kind of full of a lot of theological musings, I also think anyone who is not a Christian would also benefit from reading this book and this is definitely one that I really enjoyed so it felt appropriate to put it on this list. We're getting down to the bottom of the pile here people. Then category number 12 is the best book that checks all my fiction book boxes. As I said a number of these favorite books are books that explore themes or have kind of tropes that I really enjoy but this is one that really hit a lot of the things that I look for which is Cantoris by Carolina de Robertis. This is another one that I absolutely loved. I read this back in October for Latinx Heritage Month and this is another literary historical fiction novel that felt so well researched but was also researching a time period which was queer women living during the dictatorship in Uruguay in the 1970s. That obviously is an area of history that is not very well researched because there's not much to go on. This was obviously something that people could not be very open about and so I love that Carolina de Robertis's mission in writing this book was to kind of awaken those voices that obviously have been lost to the past. That is something that I really appreciate. Literary historical fiction was able to do that and I think Robertis did that really well in this work. I also found the relationships in here to be really lovely and I loved all the characters. I felt that I knew all of them and knew all of their motivations and overall just really enjoyed this book quite a lot. It also had the kind of multiple time periods and the time jumps which is also something that usually works for me in novels so this just really hit a lot of the things that I really love and definitely I would recommend this one as with all of these books if those are also things that you enjoy. Then category 13 is the best book that checks all of my non-fiction book boxes which was The Potlicker Papers A Food History of the Modern South by John T. Edge. This is a history non-fiction book which is usually my favorite type of non-fiction that has a lot of environmental themes given that food and sustainable eating and sustainable agriculture are all things that are pretty prominently discussed here. Additionally it also has to do with cooking which is another one of my favorite pastimes. And then finally it talks about the South which is obviously an area that's very important to me and obviously it's an area that's very important to John T. Edge and I think he takes a lot of pride in recognizing both the good and the bad in the South and acknowledging that there is this kind of paradoxical history here that needs to be acknowledged but also allows for the South to be this place of great growth and progressivism that I found to be kind of a really strong feature of this book and is also something that I definitely agree with. So this was another book that really resonated with me and definitely kind of hit a lot of my very specific book boxes. And then finally we have my best nonfiction book and my best fiction book. So my best nonfiction book actually ended up being The Third Rainbow Girl, The Long Life of a Double Murder in Appalachia by Emma Copley Eisenberg. This one I read for nonfiction November and I'm still thinking about quite a lot. This is part memoir, part history, but really more kind of American studies is the best way I can describe it in terms of taking a lot of different themes and theories and ideas and pulling them all into a cohesive narrative. I thought this was done really well. I also have a personal connection to the subject matter here given that this takes place in West Virginia which is a place that I have spent a significant amount of time and overall I just really enjoyed this book. I am definitely thinking about it still a month after having finished it and definitely think that this will be a favorite for quite a long time. And then finally what probably comes as no surprise my best fiction book of the year was Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I do know now that this book has been out for like eight-ish months that this is somewhat of a Marmite book. I know a lot of people don't love this one but I absolutely loved it. I think again there was some personal connections here for me in terms of discussing the academic world of science and how kind of rigorous and competitive but also exclusive it can be. I found those discussions to be really well done and you can definitely tell that Brandon Taylor has a background in science. I also just found Taylor's writing style to be really visceral in a way that really worked for me although I don't think it would work for everyone and I also just found the subject matter in here to be really important of discussing the ways that white allyship can actually be very self-interested to the point that it's actually not benefiting people who are not white. I also found the discussion of the intersection between academia and race to be really phenomenal and overall just really enjoyed this book quite a lot and would highly recommend it. So those are all of my reading stats slash favorite books of the year. If you have gotten to the end of this video thank you so much for watching. If any of these books are books that you really enjoyed during 2020 or are hoping to get to in 2021 do let me know down in the comment section below. Additionally if you are new to my channel I'd love to have you stick around and subscribe and I will talk to you next time. Bye!